And thank you very much. And of course, it's following Alfred. So we don't bother with any of this presidential business in the United Kingdom because we've got a queen and we've got a monarchy. And um, almost going back to the feudal times when it comes to these sort of issues. But it's um, a great pleasure to be here today. It's been a long day, isn't it? Yeah. Looking around the faces here. And what you've got between your dinner is a Scot and an Irishman. So I can't promise we're going to make quick progress when it gets to that. But it's fantastic being here in sunny Tunisia. It's absolutely delightful to be here. Talk about, I just left my constituency in Scotland. There's two inches of snow on the ground when I left there this week. Talk about the Adam Spring. I'll settle for any sort of spring when I go back to Scotland. <laughs> but Tunisia is vitally important to the region. It's vitally important to us from Northern Europe to fully understand what's going on here. Now, I've been a regular visitor to Tunisia in the course of the past two years with my work in the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. I've observed what's happened in the course of those past couple of years. The incredible transition from dictatorship to revolution, to what we're securing here today, this transition towards creating a new constitution and hopefully to fair and free elections. We don't see everyone something here and look at you with great admiration. Because what you're doing is setting a trend. And Tunisia is absolutely vital and critical in all of us. And it's critical for two very, very important and fundamental reasons. Firstly, it started here. That little spark ignited a whole region, all of the North Africa and Middle East, which engulfed dictatorships, unelected government, started just a few miles from where we gathered today. More importantly, why Tunisia is important is that you've achieved this all through peaceful and democratic means. That, and I think when we're looking around the region, that is critically important. We're seeing stalemate in Egypt just now, political stalemate, which we're all very concerned about. I think when we look at Libya, we can see the legacy of how that revolution was secured and achieved through violence and through bloodshed. And some of the reports from some of the regions in Libya are actually quite concerning. It's absolutely appalling what's happening in Syria, and there seems to be absolutely no way forward for Western engagement about how I'm trying to resolve some of the real and fundamental difficulties in Syria. And throughout the rest of the region, there's incredible standoffs between populations and some of the governments that they are still opposing. So this all started here within uh, Tunisia, and it's led to fundamental political change. It would have been almost unimaginable some 10 years ago. And nobody said it was going to be easy. You did something entirely different. I was listening to some of the sessions this morning, and some of the fundamental challenges that this transitional period has thrown up has been unexpected, and probably you didn't expect any of this to come along at all. Now, there was a British Prime Minister who was a Prime Minister in the 1970s, his name was Harold Wilson. And what he said in his very famous quote is a week is a long time in politics. What he meant with, by that quote was that things are changing all the time. Unexpected issues have flung up all the way along that time. And you talk about governments that are popular. You know, the UK government, the Conservative government, are 14% behind in the polls just now. Government parties face unpopularity from time to time. That is the natural way of governments. Governments have to make hard choices, difficult decisions, and they are punished for that by the electors who don't like what they're doing. But governments have to govern and they have to get on with dealing with the issues that have fallen up in its way. And some of the things that occurred to me, I think, would be really fascinating. It's about some of the cultural issues, some of the things that it's very hard for us from the West who are members of Parliament and who, who attend Western and Northern Parliaments. And that's the whole tension between the secular and the Islamic. And you have to find your own solution in how to deal with all of that. And all of this is new and uncharted territory. And what you're doing is actually to go towards your own solution. And it has to be a Tunisian solution when it comes to dealing with these issues. Nobody's going to do it on your behalf. Nobody's going to come along and say, this is how it's done. You are writing that book as you're going along, such as the importance of this transition that you're confronting. And you have to do it. You have to do it. The world is counting now on Tunisia and being able to deliver this democratic and peaceful transition. And I wish you all the best in all that. And you have the support of the UK government in a sense. Now, as well as being a structure member of parliament, I am a governor of 
of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Now, a lot of the people in this room know very well the work that the Foundation does, important and vital work throughout the world. And what the Foundation wants to do in Tunisia is to work very closely with the Constituent Assembly, with the Members of Parliament, with the parliamentary institutions, and most importantly with the political parties. And I want to come back to the political parties in just a moment. For the Westminster Foundation, Tunisia is an absolute priority. And we spent a lot of time, a lot of initiatives trying to secure relationships and partnerships with the Constituent Assembly and with members of Parliament. Only last week there was an inward delegation of Tunisian members of Parliament, including the Deputy Speaker, to look at how we regulate the press. I think press is absolutely critical and central to any transitional democracy. So we had an inward delegation of high profile Tunisian MPs last week, and I know that that trip was successful. And that's the sort of thing that we can do in the Westminster Foundation. What I want you to look at what we are about is that we are a gateway for that relationship and engagement. And I hope that as we move forward, the work of the Foundation will continue to be uh, something that we can expand and develop and continue to roll out as we go forward in the next few weeks and few, few months and a few years. Now, I'm a scholar. I'm from Scotland. We're going through incredible transition this time. We're going to be holding a referendum on our independence next year. We've come a long way in the last few decades. We secured our parliament in 1999. Do you know that there's 20 new parliaments in Europe created in the last 25 years? When the United Nations first came back in 1946 after the Second World War, there was only 50 or so members of the United Nations. There's about 190 members of the United Nations. I want my country, Scotland, to be a member, an independent member of the United Nations in two years. I want my country, Scotland, to be the same as Tunisia. Normal, self-governing and independent. And we are going to offer the Scottish people the option to consider that. Now that's never been done before in a Western government. Now we've had independence movements in Eastern Europe and throughout the world, but we have never tested the opinion of a Western democracy to ask a, a stretch of that, do you want to be an independent nation, yes or no? So this is an incredible experiment in democracy once again. And this is why I'm saying that transitions to democracy, transitions and constitutional change is universal and applies everywhere. But there are certain rules that underline all of this, and certain rules that are fundamental to everything that we try to achieve in Scotland and what you're trying to see here, and you've got your transition towards democracy. In, in Tunisia. And critical to that is the will of the people. We have to ensure that there's consent to everything that we did. Democracy is the engine and the lubricant of all constitutions. It's the will of the people that must secure and underline in everything that we do when we come to all these things. So it's important that the people are consulted. Now, I look at constitutions throughout Europe. I was in Iceland very recently. You remember Iceland, it's that little island in the very, very north of like half a million people. It went bankrupt during the banking crisis a few years ago. And it started to build itself. And do you know what it did in an experiment in constitution building? It actually asked its people, what do you want in the constitution? It was a constitution determined by the community and by the society. And when I was there, I saw some of the drafts. It is an absolutely incredible document, never been done before, and something which is a real experiment in how we decide to determine our constitution. Now, I'm not saying that's one of the other, Iceland is a small nation, there's a very, very close community, and these things can happen. But that's an example of some of the thinking that goes behind creating some of these things. Now, I know that in Tunisia, you're working hard to try and secure some of all this. But in order to secure these free and fair elections, you need political parties. Now, I've worked with some of the political parties here in Tunisia, and I, can I promise you that they're in a dreadful state, they're in an awful state. Now, I heard some of the political discussion here, we can all do this, we're all politicians, we can all make fine speeches and say what we're going to do. But unless you have a viable, effective political party that can communicate with the electorate, that can determine policies and agenda which has something different to say, something worthwhile contesting, you're going to go nowhere. Now, a democracy is only as good as the political parties that contest it. So it's absolutely vital that we can 
continue to engage with the political parties, that we build the capacity of the political parties, that we try to ensure that the schools are necessary to be effective parliamentarians are there, and that is a way to help making sure that you can do and we all can be effective democracies. Now, in the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, a key and critical role is something that we take very seriously as our inter-party work. We work party to party. We try to mentor and support political parties, not just here in Tunisia, but throughout the whole developing world. We see it as our role and our responsibility to ensure that political parties are in a fit state to challenge governments and to stand for election and have something difficult to see. And that message could be communicated effectively. So we spend a lot of time working directly with political parties to build that infrastructure, to build that capacity and give them a proper opportunity to contest election. It's an important and vital part of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy's work. And we'll continue to do that. But what I've observed looking at some of the political parties around Tunisia is a failure to be able to connect with the constituencies, with people who are electors, people who will be you're expected to vote for you in elections. That has to be improved. That capacity has to be increased as you go forward to your elections next time, next time around. You have to find a way to ensure that you get that space, whether that's in assemblies, whether that's in conferences, to develop that policy agenda that will be distinctive and will be different and that you can take to the people to ensure that you can do this. Now, political parties will come and go. I don't know, I remember last when I first came to Tunisia, I think there were something like 70 political parties that were contesting the constituent assembly. I know that there's been massive realignments and there's been different coalitions and different arrangements, but there's still an awful lot of political parties in Tunisia, if I'm correct. That's the strength, and that can work. But as long as these political parties are saying something different and have an appeal and have a political constituency, it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile to do. So I think that's